In previous episodes, we discussed the scandalous family known as the Borgias. As many of you know, this is by far one of my favorite families to talk about. Their lives, their pettiness, their evil ways is one of pure entertainment for us living 500 years later. But nonetheless, there are things that we can learn. Things we can learn from this family that have to do with our current affairs. And as many of us know, things are not always as they seem. And one of the greatest mysteries regarding this scandalous family, to me, has to do with their apartments. The place where they lived at the Vatican 500 years ago. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. If you would like to help support this channel and join our patron or our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. Today, we're going to be talking about the mystery behind the Borgia apartments and the coming of the Antichrist. I am so excited to be back with you guys after a little bit of a break, and I am equally as excited to be kicking off my this first episode after a break, talking once again about the Borgias. Now, I am actually recording this while I am traveling, so that is why there won't be any film footage of me speaking to you, just a voiceover for this episode. As always, whenever I do voiceover podcast only, I do try to align appropriate pictures with the subject that I am talking about. So as we go through the Borgia apartments, please know that I'm going to be trying to align different pictures of each room with the room that we're referring to. Now, again, as you guys know, the Borgias are an incredibly nefarious and scandalous family. I mean, they lived 500 years ago, and literally I cannot tell you how many movies have been made over this family, how many books have been written about this family. Even in our own lifetime, there have been two series created about the Borgia, one on Showtime with Jeremy Irons playing the notorious Rodrigo Borgia, who would become known as Pope Alexander VI. Now, as you guys probably know from our other videos where we did deep dives into all the different family members, the shenanigans that the Borgias got up to were really no different than a lot of their peers at this time in history. The only difference really is that they were a family. This was definitely a crime family and definitely a family affair when it comes to everything that they got themselves involved in. Also, on top of that, during the reign of Pope Alexander VI or Rodrigo Borgia, there were a lot of significant historical events that happened according, of course, to the official narrative. For example, Rodrigo Borgia was given the papacy in 1492. This, of course, was the same year that Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas. We also know that when Rodrigo Borgia was merely just a cardinal, he was the person that was given the, the, the power from the previous Pope Sixtus to give compensation to the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. Of course, this is huge. This is what brought Spain together, Castile and Aragon together as one country, 
And of course, going back to Christopher Columbus, the this was the the empire that funded Christopher Columbus's voyage. We also know that Pope Alexander VI, for anybody who is from South America, he was the Pope that drew the line that divided territory belonged to that belonged to Portugal versus territory that belonged to Spain. This is why today, as they tell us, as history teaches us, Brazil speaks Portuguese and the rest of South America speaks Spanish. Now we know from our recent deep dives into this family that like a lot of these very powerful families in Italy, in Europe at this time, the Borgias definitely had a lot of enemies. For families like the Borgia, you either loved them or you hated them, or third option, you tried to stay on their good side so that they would not unalive you. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail about the Borgias in this particular episode because I'm assuming most of you already know or roughly know their story. If you're new to this channel, first of all, welcome, but I'm assuming if you're new, you clicked on the video because you are aware and are probably very entertained, like I am, by the scandalous Borgia family. But if not, if you're not familiar with the Borgias, no fear, I will put down in the description box all of our past deep dives into this family so you have a better understanding of why this mystery, this legend of the Borgia apartments is so interesting to me. Now, I do like a good conspiracy. I think a lot of us do. Even if we believe the conspiracy or not, sometimes it's definitely fun to entertain another possibility. And they tell us that after the passing of Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia, that Pope Julius II abandoned the Borgia apartments. They tell us historically that Julius II was so disgusted by his predecessor that he decided he wanted nothing to do with the rooms, the apartment, where such scandalous events as the Banquet of Chestnuts happened. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I smell a foul with this. They say that the Borgia apartments remained sealed off from the early 1500s, 1503 was the date of Alexander's passing, to the 19th century. It is stated that in 1816, the frescoes, the paintings, were removed from the sealed off Borgia apartments, but then in 1889, Pope Leo XIII restored the apartments and opened them to the public. The Borgia apartments themselves are considered a part of the Vatican Library. Now, Pope Leo XIII is also the Pope that opened up part of the secret Vatican Library for scholars to come and have a little look-see through some of the information that's been hidden from the public for years. And some of this information, as you guys may recall, were diaries that were kept during the reign of the Borgias, which is how we learned about even more of these scandalous, we'll say, quote unquote, parties that happened at the Vatican and so forth. So Pope Leo XIII really kind of did us a solid <laughs> because we now know even more about this family because of him deciding to open this up to the public. Now, again, they say that it was sealed. These apartments were completely sealed for a few hundred years. I, of course, I don't believe that that is actually the case. And in some, some stuff, some discord, you will see that perhaps they weren't necessarily sealed, but perhaps they were used for cardinals for a little while. They just weren't really maintained. Again, I smell a rat. I feel like these rooms have been used by the Vatican for very specific rituals, if you get my drift. Of course, I have no way of backing this. This is purely my, my opinion and me speculating because as we know, if we've learned anything over these last four or five years, nothing is ever as it seems. Now, when it comes to the passing of Pope Alexander VI, 
there's already quite a mystery around it. Again, as I said, the Borgias had many enemies. And if you look in the official historic documents, there are two, two main suspects over who or how Rodrigo Borgia, Pope Alexander VI, actually passed. One of the suspects is malaria. And I do believe that the powers that be, the establishment, the Aluma Shmati, as we say on this channel, for obvious reasons, that they want us to believe that maybe this was just merely a situation involving malaria. And that's absolutely believable. I mean, where I live in, in Georgia, in the Southeast, at this time when the settlers started coming in, it was swampland. There was malaria here. Obviously, there was malaria in Italy, yellow fever. This was definitely something people were very concerned about. However, the more we dig, the more we realize that it was probably poison. <laughs> like that, let's just be honest. So I'm going to read you guys. I just read, I just finished reading a book called The Borgia Bride. And this is a fi fictional book based off of uh, Sancha of Aragon, who of course was married to Joffrey Borgia and was the mistress to both Cesare and Juan Borgia. And in the afterword, at the end of the book, it talks about the quote unquote downfall of the Borgia dynasty. And I, I personally, and I think many of you do not believe that the Borgia dynasty actually did have a downfall. I think they're still very much in power to this day. But I kind of wanted to read you this afterward because this is very fascinating. The writer goes on to write, and I'm going to have to change some words just because of the algorithms here on YouTube and their terms and services. So I know you guys are used to that by now. So forgive me, though, I will have to change some of these words. So she goes on to say, the details of Pope Alexander VI viewing and burial are particularly gruesome. After his unaliving, his body was washed and clothed and following custom put on display in St. Peter's so that it could be visited by the faithful. But as it lay in state, the Pope's body swelled monstrously and blackened, becoming so frightful in appearance that it was covered. The people began to murmur that Alexander had been possessed by the devil or had at the very least sold his soul for temporal power. Accompanied by a small group, the body was swiftly carried away for burial to the same chapel where Alfonso of Aragon had been taken only a few years before. The actual interment was horrific. Alexander's corpse was so swollen, it failed to fit in the coffin and was literally beaten into it with shovels. A great stone was placed atop the grave to keep the lid in place. So this definitely lends more credence to poisoning than malaria. Now, it's interesting that in this afterward, it talks about how people at the time of Italy believed that Pope Alexander VI body reacted this way after his passing because he was possessed or maybe had sold his soul. And so this brings us, uh, before we get to the apartments, this brings us to another character who kind of existed within the realm of the Borgia dynasty. And this was a priest who believed that Rodrigo Borgia was the Antichrist. And this was a priest known by the name of Savonarella. Now, again, you guys, I am not Italian. And I have listened to and researching this particular priest, I have researched a lot of different podcasts. I've listened to a lot of different scholars and other people who work in seminary speak about this man. And it has dawned on me and it's come to my attention with other characters in the story too. The different accents do pronounce names differently. And I had some pushback with the way I say Lucrezia, which is the way all Americans say Lucrezia. So I'm going to ask that you guys please be respectful for accents. Um, with, with the truth being told, if we all were to step back in time and go back 500 years ago, I don't think any of us would be saying their names the way that they said their names because our language evolves, right? So Savonrella is how we say this guy's name here in the United States. It's how the American professors pronounce his name. He was a, a precursor to the Protestant Reformation, which I thought was super, super interesting. And I've, you know, we've covered the Protestant Reformation a lot 
on this channel, especially in regards to the missing books of the Bible and uh, King James, who wrote the King James Bible, and that guy was definitely not a saint. He had, had no one's in best interest at heart when he basically made up the King James Bible. But nonetheless, I found this very fascinating. And the only reason why a lot of historians believe he was a precursor to the Protestant Reformation is because a lot of the stuff that Savonarella was, was irritated by with the Vatican and with the papacy really becomes issues of the Protestant Reformation, not all of them. And this is where the argument lies too, because some historians say, no, he was still very much aligned with the idea of a pope or the idea of there being a Vatican, which one of the big things about the Protestants is that they don't believe in a pope. They don't believe that one human being has dominance and is the mouth of God on earth, whereas Savonarella did believe, still believe in this idea of a pope. He just was more focused on the fact that many of in Christendom had, had walked away from this idea of a personal relationship with God. It had become very much a um, business. Christianity, the Vatican had become definitely a business. And, you know, with our other research into the history of these things, we know that the Vatican has never been a place of, of real Christianity. But nonetheless, my opinions aside, there are many people who do believe Savonarella was the first person to kind of give a, a murmur into what would become the Protestant Reformation. In fact, a lot of his teachings got really big in Germany and Switzerland, or what, what we call Germany today, today, the Germanic principalities in Switzerland. And of course, we know that Martin Luther, the Lutheran uh, man who really kicked off the Protestant Reformation big time, he, um, he used, he was very heavily influenced by Savonarella's preachings. Now, with that being said, I'm not a huge fan of Savonarella. In my own studying of him, this dude was definitely a zealot. He was definitely what we would call today a fundamentalist. Um, definitely no joy in this man's life. He was born on the 21st of September, 1452. He was born into a very wealthy Italian medical family, and he ended up having a very good education. So he was kind of born into the lap, lap of luxury. Now, at 23, Savonarella gave up his worldly possessions to become a friar. With the dawning of the Renaissance, he felt that man had stepped away from God. And that is very interesting to consider, looking at the Renaissance historically and how all of a sudden we're shifting from these dark ages into this age of enlightenment, this age of, of arts, this age of hu humanism, and, and really starting to understand the experience in a more artistic view of humanity. And I, I've never really thought about that until really deeply looking at the board, just how this can create a lot of friction. So I, I, I bet Savonarello was not the only person to be almost afraid of this renaissance. Like all of a sudden, all these things are happening where there's the world is changing. And I think anytime the world changes, you have people who become terrified of the change that is coming. I mean, look at our world today. We have a lot of growth in technology. And even though I know technology absolutely might not be in our, our, our best interest with AI and stuff, sometimes I wonder if that fear is just because it's a fear of the unknown, right? And so if that makes sense. So with Savonarella, I think there definitely was a, a panic of the unknown. And this, this man seemed to be quite obsessed with like the book of Revelation. And so again, it kind of comes down to this scrupulosity, which we talked about with um, Padre Pio in that episode. Like, is Savonarella's anxiety about the Renaissance coming because he had an OCD about studying the Bible? I mean, that's just something to think about. But nonetheless, he really was challenged emotionally by the coming Renaissance. And he felt like this, this beauty, this art, this extravagance that was popping up from the dark ages was a sign of the end of times. And we know about this because of all these, not just because of his, his lectures, his, his preaching. Uh, we also know about this because he wrote lots of letters to his family, trying to explain himself as to why he gave up the worldly possessions that he was given, the privileges he was given to become a friar. Savonarella also believed that he was a prophet, 
um, that he was getting visions from God, warnings from God. I have a huge, you guys know I have huge issues with people who claim to be prophets. Uh, according to the law of one, with the, the sight of light does not believe in prophets, right? Everybody is a direct line to God, right? And just because you're getting a vision does not mean that vision applies to everyone else. So I obviously don't like it when people say that they have a vision from God and they're trying to control people based on their own imagination or their own their own belief of what's right and what's wrong. I think that crosses lines, that crosses boundaries into other people's free will. But nonetheless, this happened again 500 years ago. Now, he also felt like Florence, where he was from, was going to be the new Jerusalem, which I think is very fascinating because we see that even today, that people are talking about where the new Jerusalem is going to be, which is mentioned in Revelation. So things don't change, right? We're same, same story, different timeline. So again, he believed that Florence was going to be the new Jerusalem and it was opposed to Rome and the Vatican. Now, in order for Florence to be the new Jerusalem, he had to get rid of the Medici family. We've talked about them too. They were another crime family in Italy. They were huge, right? And so he not only had issues with the Borgias, but he also had issues with the Medicis. He would do these bonfires of vanity, which again, I find super fascinating because hello, I live in the South. I've seen this happen before where he would have his parishioners, his followers, throw art from the Renaissance into a bonfire because they felt like it was offensive. Like art that we cherish now and that we try to preserve now, they were throwing into a bonfire because they thought it was offensive. So again, the time changes, the timelines change, but humans don't change, do we? Now, again, he was very, very focused on Revelation for the end of times. He would write out his sermons and he would decorate his sermons. So we're talking about propaganda here so that they would attract people. He developed quite a little following. A lot of people, now again, I can definitely see how this would happen because of the friction with the Renaissance. We're moving from one time period to another time period, a dark age to the Renaissance. It's confusion for everyone as certain families are rising to power. It's causing more war and chaos amongst the common folks. It's, it's a, I mean, look at what's happening to us right now in our time period. We're moving into a new timeline and look at the the friction we're in, you know? So, so I can definitely see how people would be misled by someone like Savonrella. I mean, the same thing is happening today on Telegram where people are being misled by people who claim to be telling the truth or disclosing information and not that's not necessarily true. So he developed quite a big following. And in September of 1494, King Charles VIII of France invaded Italy. We've spoken about this in multiple of the deep dives into the different family members of the Borgia, so I'm not going to go into great detail with this. But just again, you guys, just to clarify, at this time, the Italian peninsula was not a unified country. It was not a political entity as it is today. It was a bunch of principalities and duchies. And they were being governed and ruled by all these different empires that would come in and overthrow the next empire. We see that a lot with Naples. And so it wasn't weird for France to be coming in to try to take control of some of these principalities of Italy. Italy had great agriculture. It was very prosperous for these empires to gain, gain control of basically farmland in Italy. And so we see this with King Charles VIII of France. He comes into Italy because we've got this man coming in with his army. People believe that Savonarello was right and that this, these were the end of times. And this was the Armageddon. And Savonarella actually used this to his advantage because at this point he was quite famous himself as a priest and King Charles VIII was not a fan of the Borgias, neither was Savonarella. So he kind of buddied up with King Charles VIII and tried to persuade him to go through Italy to bring about the second coming of Christ. Now, it's interesting, if you go back and watch the Showtime series, with Jeffrey Irons, you actually see this happen. Like you see the relationship between Savonrella and Charles VIII. They don't make a big deal about it. I think it was a much bigger deal than Showtime made it, but you definitely, definitely see this in that, in that episode. Now, on May 22nd, 1497, Savonrella was excommunicated by Pope Alexander VI, but for a year he continued to preach. 
Now, again, he thought Pope Alexander VI was the Antichrist. And this was big. He, this is not just a little blip in history. Like he preached this a lot over and over and over and over again. And we know with programming, with learning, with mind control, you have to say things repeatedly for people to take what is your opinion as fact, if that makes sense. And so he was part of the resistance to Pope Alexander VI. Now, again, I'm not trying to excuse Pope Alexander VI because the guy was an absolute psychopath and was awful, but obviously he wasn't the Antichrist. But it was easy for Savonarella to convince people that Pope Alexander VI was the Antichrist because he was so hated and he was so debaucherous that it, it was, you know, Rodrigo Borgia basically made it easy for, for Savonarella to do this. Now, I am not going to go deeply into what happened. Uh, if you guys want me to do a deeper dive into Savonarella, because the end of his life is very interesting with some archaic trials they used to do. And I can do, I, I kind of looked a little, I kind of want to do a deep dive into some of these trials they would put people under to see if they were really prophets of God back in this time. It was quite brutal. Um, if you guys want me to do a deeper dive into that, I'll be more than happy to. But for this episode, all I'm going to tell you is that Savonrella was um, unalived by the court on the 23rd of May, 1498, as a heretic. Obviously, Pope Alexander VI got him in the end, right? So just so you guys know, like as we're going into the apartment... There's a lot of shenanigans and a lot of people just do not like the Borgias and they, a lot of people, not just, not just the nobles, not just the other crime families, but the people believe at this point that Pope Alexander VI is the Antichrist. And again, Pope Alexander VI nor his children did a lot to like dispel those rumors. Let's be honest. I, I think they kind of liked having those rumors because they could get away with their debauchery. Now, before we get into the apartments themselves, I want to take a brief moment just to shout out two of our sponsors, two of our sponsors that are under the umbrella of the same company. This is Spooky 2 Rife Machines and the Mira Mate uh, Technology Pad. I'm gonna play a brief commercial for Miramate. Now down in the description box below, you'll see a link to both of these websites. And if you enter my name at checkout, Bryce Watson, that's B-R-I-C-E, W-A-T-S-O-N, you get 5% off of any and all your purchases from both of these companies. Hi, I'm gonna to talk to you about Miramate today. It is something that I discovered just about two months ago. I had been just fighting excruciating knee pain after I took a back step into a hole and twisted it. I had the usual treatment, you know, they, they checked it out and they said that there was no tear, but there had to have been a tear, even though it was just too small to see, because it just wasn't healing. It burned, it hurt, it was bruisy, it, it was swollen, it just wasn't good. And so I tried all the usual, you know, the pain medication, the NSAIDs, and none of that seemed to be helping at all. So then I did a little research and thought, well, okay, I'll try a near-infrared device. That device did help some, and now we're talking about two months later. So I hurt my knee in June, and in August I was still hurting, so then I went ahead and ordered this device, and in September I tried it for about three weeks before it started working at all, and it really wasn't taking me over to where I needed to be in order to be able to function, to walk normally, and even to sleep. This thing was keeping me awake. Um, so then I um, talked to a friend about it, and she said, oh, well, you have to try this. You know, here, you get this, this PEMF device from Miramade. It's reasonable, and it works. It'll heal. I didn't believe it, but of course, when you're in a lot of pain, you're always searching for a solution. So therefore, I went ahead and ordered it. It came quickly. It was amazing. And this is not an unboxing thing, but I do want to show you that this is the Mini Magic. That is what I ordered. It comes with a power cord. You can use it with batteries. And the standard order comes with this device, which I have taped together because I was using it on my dog. But this is two leads, and you put these on different sides, you know, with the little things poking out, and then you can wrap it up with the elastic bands that they give you. They give you a small one, like if you want to use it for your wrist, and they also give you a big one if you want to use it in any other part of your body. 
like for me, it was for my knee. I went ahead and also ordered the quads because I do suffer from back pain and hip pain. And I thought, well, if it cures my knee or makes me feel better that way, then it's bound to work on those pains as well. And that will require the bigger ones. So I ordered the mini with the standard and the quad. It came. I used it immediately. Within three days of using this thing, I started to get relief. Now, mind you, I was just grateful to get relief. But I was like, will it actually heal me? So I continued to use it, and I felt that I wasn't making enough progress. For some reason, it seemed to be working, but not as much. So I decided to use the quad on my knee. And doing that, within a week's time, I was walking normally again. It was an incredible thing. It was amazing, almost miraculous. I mean, it almost brings me to tears because nothing else had worked. Nothing the doctors had done, nothing that I had done on my own. You know, the cold, the heat, all that stuff that they always tell you to do, rest, none of it had worked. And this thing not only took the pain and inflammation away almost instantaneously within those first three days, but within a week's time, I was walking almost completely normally. And by the end of the second week, I actually forgot that I had been injured when I started doing more activities around the house. And so I'm a believer. Um, in fact, I find that this thing is not only so easy to use. I mean, it has three settings. You can use it with a battery so you can carry it with you. You can plug it in to your computer because it has a USB. You also get a cube so you can plug it in to electricity. And you can use it any way you'd like, anywhere you'd like. I didn't use it for that long. I only used it for about half an hour to an hour a day. Um, so, um, at first, and then once I realized that it was working, then I started using it a little bit more as recommended. And of course now I only use it if and when something flares up. Now I have come to find that this has made such a difference. With my health issues, I do suffer from pain all the time. And I also got COVID and with COVID my vision for some reason was affected. If I put these things on almost like eyeglasses and just give myself a short treatment, my vision clarifies so it gets clearer. I don't know how it works or why it works, but it works. So my vision has been improving since I started doing that. In fact, I um, did some more research throughout all of this and found out that not only is it a very safe um, type of method of treatment or therapy, but you can also use it on animals. And so here I have my little guy. Tito. And little Tito, he suffers from dry eye. And so right now I'm spending about $160 a month to treat this little guy's dry eyes. That's a lot of money. Not only that, but I can tell that even though I am giving him his medications religiously three times a day, and he has four medications, that his little eyes still hurts because he there's a little bit of extra blinking, he scratches at it, and he rubs it. But what I have seen and what I have done is I've gone ahead, and that's why these were taped, because I was using them on him. And so I just put them together, so that way I have one. And then I just put it over his eye like that, and then we use it as a bonding time where I just literally cuddle him, and he just gets his treatment about five, to five minutes, that's it. And I have seen some improvement. Even if I'm a little late on his medications, you know, I try to be very religious, but even if I am a tiny bit late, his eye is not drying out as much as it was. And although he's still rubbing, I just started doing this a week or so ago, and it's only five minutes a day, but even though he's still rubbing, it's not quite as bad as it was. So I think it's working, and I'm very eager to continue doing it on a daily basis and see if we can get him to a better place and see what the vet says without telling the vet when he goes in for his treatment in January. I'm excited. I'm also excited and such a believer that I decided to um, purchase the mat and I can't wait to get it. And I look forward to maybe getting better health and less pain. <laughs> anyway, thanks. If you decide to try it, I hope it works as well for you as it did for me.
All right, you guys, let's get into the Borgia apartments that have only been open to the public a little over 100 years since they were quote unquote sealed off. So this is a suite of rooms in the Apostolic Palace in the Vatican. So the Vatican, the Apostolic Palace in the Vatican is basically the home of the Pope. And inside this palace, it consists of apartments, offices, chapels, the library, and also the Sistine Chapel. Now, I've mentioned before that I have spent some time in Rome, and I've definitely been to the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. The Vatican City is weird. It's a very strange, surreal experience. The last time I was there, I was not on YouTube and was not into, like, I mean, I was into, like, folklore and legends and conspiracies, but I wasn't, like, thinking about it and doing shows on it. And so when I went to the Vatican City, when I was there, you can definitely feel the intensity when you're in there. And that's probably a lot of trapped energy from the hundreds of years of shenanigans that have taken place within those walls. It's not very big. You do have to cover your shoulders if you're a woman, which, you know, I mean, a lot of religions do that. I, I kind of still scoff at that because, you know, it's hot and listen, if you can't handle a woman, if you're a man and you cannot handle a woman's shoulder, that's your problem. That's not that's not the woman's problem. But that's, that's a conversation for a different day. Now, in the Vatican, there is a lot to see. Even though it's a very small place, there's a lot of art that's held there. And so if you're someone like me who loves history and loves art, it's going to take you a while to get through it just because there's so much to see. With that being said, I honestly cannot remember if we went to the Borgia apartments or not. And that's shocking that I can't remember because by this time I was obviously still a huge fan of studying the Borgias, but I was with some girlfriends. It was a trip some girlfriends and I had taken. And so I'll have to go and ask my friends if, if they remember if we went to the Borgia apartments or not. It's kind of a blur. Like even though it was intense, all the rooms kind of in my mind, my memory kind of run together. But the Sistine Chapel. Like I do, that that stood out being in the Sistine Chapel. Obviously, you can't take any pictures when you're in there, and it's very quiet. You go in there, and there are guards everywhere. But I do remember st standing in the Sistine Chapel and just kind of taking it in for a moment because it's such a famous chapel within the Vatican. So with that being said, if you are going to Italy and you want to go to the Vatican City, I would definitely suggest making sure you, you go to the Borgia Apartments when you're in the Vatican. Get a tour guide if you need to. Um, it's near the Sistine Chapel. It's right, you know, it's right in that Apostolic Palace region. Now, the Sistine Chapel obviously is a very famous, famous um, artifact from the Renaissance, right? And there was an artist that assisted with the painting of the Sistine Chapel. And this was an artist named Pentericchio. Now, Pentericchio, this name means little painter. So he was probably a small guy. Um, which I would be curious to see what his height actually was. That's something I'm interested in learning because back then, human beings, people were not as big as we are today. So um, he must have been really small. He was born in 1454. Again, he was a Renaissance painter. He was very famous for his frescoes. He helped with the Sistine Chapel. Now, the Sistine Chapel is named after Pope Sixtus, who again ruled before Alexander VI, Pope Sixtus is the one who is very famous for drinking the red fluid that comes out of the body from two little boys, if you know what, I'm what I mean. Now, when Pope Alexander VI passed away, Pentericchio left Rome. And at this time, all of his works that weren't completed were completed by Michelangelo and Raphael, two big names we know from the Renaissance. Now, Pentericchio, the reason why he left Rome in 1503 at the, the passing of Pope Alexander VI is because Pentericchio was the main artist who worked on the Borgia apartments and painted the rooms, the six rooms that were designed specifically for the Borgias. So I'm sure that there are things that he saw, that he knew, that he probably felt like if he didn't leave Rome they were gonna be coming for him next. But let's go through these rooms. So again, there were six rooms that were designated as the Borgia apartments. One was the room of the pontiff, and that's the bedroom. 
So we're not going to really focus on the bedroom because believe it or not, my friends, most of the shenanigans did not happen in the bedroom. <laughs> they happened in the other rooms. So we have the room of the Sybils and the room of the Creed, which are located in the Borgia Tower. We also have the room of the liberal arts and the saints and the mysteries. And these are some of what they consider to be Pope Alexander VI secret rooms. These were the rooms where Alexander had his master of ceremonies come and perform certain rituals, which I find super fascinating. All right, let's talk about the room of the Sibyls. The room of the Sibyls was the main room. And in this room, there are frescoes that show 12 depictions of the Old Testament stories and the prophets. Now, Sibyls itself is a Greek word that means a prophetess or oracle in ancient Greece. This is interesting because we know from past deep dives into the Borgias that Caesare Borgia, as I admitted, on Aquarius Rising Africa, I have a little bit of a historical crush on Cesare, even though he was a total nasty human, but he was a bad boy and I have a thing for bad boys. But nonetheless, Cesare Borgia um, was the inspiration for the Jesus painting. For all the Jesus paintings that you see in your churches, on the candles, that's Cesare Borgia. And I have an episode on that. I'll place a link to that in the description box below. That is only on rumble because we couldn't put it on here so i find it interesting that we know that the word jesus is not the name of the person who lived his name was yashua bin yosef yashua with a if you change the y to a j it comes joshua not jesus jesus means of zeus it's from the dionysian cult which is actually the start of all these secret societies so that i find super interesting that there is a a nod within the borgia apartment to these uh, Greek, Greece priestesses that connect to Zeus, that connect to Dionysi, which was a cannibalistic cult that is the basis for secret societies today. And that they're allegedly, with, with, as conspiracy will state, that these, this room, this was the main room where a lot of these crazy rituals, like the banquet of chestnuts, happened. Anyway. On the ceiling, there were seven planets pulled by animals that represented the zodiac. And the seven planets themselves were represented by Roman divinities. Now, I will say, too, before I forget to mention this, within all these rooms weaved in and out of all of these paintings were hints at the Borgia's own divinity or the divinity that they thought they had. And there's also weaved throughout these paintings the coat of arms, which belonged exclusively to the Borgias. We also know in some of these paintings, Lucrezia herself was used as the inspiration for some of these um, di divine females from the Bible and from Greek and Roman stories. Uh, we do know that there were allegations of Lucrezia having an inappropriate relationship with both her father and her brother Cesare. Um, and given what we know about the Aluma Shmati, that's not far off from what they do with their own children. So I find that very, very, very fascinating. Now the second room is the a room of the Creed. And this is based off of the Apostles' Creed. And this was also in the Borgia Tower as well. And so the Apostles' Creed, for those who did not grow up, Christian is the symbol of faith. I remember having to say this. I grew up Presbyterian, and I remember having to say this every single Sunday. And I would always ask my mother why we say that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church because we were Protestants. And my mother would just kind of push it off like, oh, it's just an homage to like the mothership, like where we all came from. Now we know that's not the case. But I'm going to go ahead and read you guys the Apostles' Creed for those who do, do not know what this is or did not grow up in a Christian uh, church. I will also put the script on the screen as well. The Apostles' Creed in English states, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born 
of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, descended into hell, rose again from the dead, and on the third day ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, who will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So again, some variation of that is always repeated every Sunday in church, no matter what church you go to, for those that did not grow up Christian again. So you might have a slight variation if you're a different denomination. I think that a lot of this is BS. Uh, obviously, this is definitely the story of Mithra, not of, of um, Yeshua. Uh, again, that's a story for a different day that comes from the missing books of the Bible. But we know when we repeat stuff that it becomes almost like a spell, like some sorcery. And also we become brainwashed by it, right? We know that this Apostles' Creed was allegedly, we don't know, we allege that it was created in the 5th century. So this little spell, this little sorcery that we say every Sunday, um, definitely been around for a very, very, very long time. Now the sealing of the Apostles' Creed is definitely very de decorated in geometrical features, which is um, interesting to me because geometry is a huge um, part of ancient spirituality, like shapes and values and different symbols. So I find that super, super fascinating. So we have all these in this room, all these symbols of fate that go back to the Apostles' Creed along with geometrical shapes. Then we come to the room of the liberal arts. So the seven liberal arts at this time were grammar, rhetoric, logic, geometry, arithmetic, music, and astronomy. Now, each of these liberal arts in this particular room were shown as a celestial woman. We also have a justice on the throne that is shown as a woman, which again is super fascinating because even though this is the Renaissance, women are still property. They're still not autonomous beings, but we do know that in the, the Renaissance, um, women, the, the beauty of a woman's body was starting to be um, enhanced through art. So we do see women being used a lot, not just in the Borgia apartments, but in other paintings as well um, as, uh, for, as a muse for the artist. So I, anyway, just a side note. Now in 2016, restoration began in this room and they uncovered a damaged painting of what's called the resurrection. And this actually illustrates Native Americans in Europe. Fascinating, right? Now, here's the thing. Given the official narrative that we're told in school about 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, yes, there could have been Native Americans by 1494 when this was done, had already been brought over to Europe as slaves or whatever, but part of me kind of thinks, was this painting hidden for a while? Because, like, maybe it disproves the official narrative? I don't know. Just something. I have no idea. Just something to speculate about. Very interesting. Now, the Room of Saints, this was the secret room. The lives of the seven saints in the Bible are depicted in this room. This was, now, I, I didn't know. Okay, so side note. Again, grew up Protestant. Protestants don't have saints. So I didn't know who the seven saints in the Bible were. I know the Bible pretty well. I mean, I, that's kind of what I do on this channel. I've been through all the missing books of the Bible, the actual Bible. Like, we've, like, torn that thing apart. But I didn't grow up with saints as a Presbyterian. So this was news to me, that there were seven saints in the Bibles. If you, if you grew up Catholic, I want to hear more about these seven saints from you and what you grew up, grew up hearing about them when you were a kid in Catholic Sunday school. So the seven saints in the Bible are Elizabeth, Anthony, Barbara, Suzanne, Sebastian, Paul, and Catherine. Now what's fascinating to me, my friends, is these are very modern names. Modern for, you know, the 1400s and for us today. We know that most of the names in the Bible are not the original names anyway. Like most of these Jewish guys did not walk around with names like Peter. You know, the J didn't even exist back then. So some of these names could be adaptations from names that existed during the times of Yeshua. I don't know. Let me know in the comment section, though, for my Catholic friends. Like, tell me more about this because this is fascinating to me. Now, so that's on the wall, right, of this room of the secret room of saints. We have on the wall 
the lives of these seven saints from the Bible. Now on the ceiling, we have the Isis and Osiris story. And we know that Pope Alexander VI was very fascinated with um, Egyptian history and cultural. Now the room of mysteries, this was the room that depicted the mysteries of faith. So mysteries of faith would be things like the virgin birth, like things that really walking on water, turning water into wine, things that are that come about by faith. And it's written that this was like a good room for people who were new to Christianity to, to like learn these basic Bible stories. I I call BS on that too because I don't think they were interested. At one point, no point in history do I think any of these popes have been really interested. In, um, in, in, in expanding the faith and saving souls. We're going to get more into that when we go deeper into the descendants of the Borgias. We're going to get into the Jesuits and stuff like that. So we'll expand upon that theory a little bit in a few weeks, a little bit later on. All right, you guys. So that those are the rooms, This the six rooms of the Borgias. And again, I want to know if you've been in these rooms. I want to know your thoughts on the conspiracy behind why they sealed these rooms off for so many years. Now, again, I want to reiterate, I don't believe that they sealed them off from everybody. I think they sealed them off from the public. I believe that these rooms have been used all this time. And for some reason, something happened where Pope Leo the Thirteenth, even though he did us a solid, I don't know if he was a good guy or not. But he opened this all up to the public for some reason. I don't think that the, this, again, the story is these rooms were just sealed off from everyone, even the people who lived in the Vatican. But I call BS on that. I think they were sealed off from the public. I think that is the story that we've been given by the establishment, by the Illumishmati. I think that these rooms have been used all this time. That's just my conspiracy mind, my skepticism, um, and what I know through my research, you know? So... Again, just my opinion. Um, again, but leave me your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. Now, please be careful of the words that you use. Please be careful with the words that you use, guys, because we know that the powers that be don't like us talking about these things unless we're lighthearted about them and make them sound like they are just random conspiracies. And, you know, you know what I'm saying. So just be very careful with how you write your opinions down in the comment section below. And make sure to join us on Monday on Aquarius Rising Africa at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be talking about this again, but live. And I'm really excited. For those who don't know, who are new to my channel, I will link Aquarius Rising Africa in the description box below. I go on Shanti's channel every Monday and every Wednesday. And what I like to do, because Shanti, my friend Shanti, is really good at seeing patterns, and she works a lot with whistleblowers. So she has like a crash course education in these types of matters and so she sees things that maybe we don't see and so what i like to do for those who are new to this channel is i like to go ahead and present the basic information to you guys first on my channel so that you have a basic understanding of what we're going to be talking about or you can take what i've put out on my channel and then you can go research it yourself and then you can contribute to the conversation on monday because you guys like i there are a couple of conspiracies that I'm working on right now where information is being erased off the internet. And this is one of them. So I think with all of our heads put together, we can figure out what the hell is going on with these Borgia apartments. And I cannot wait to hear your thoughts. I cannot wait to hear your thoughts in the comment section below and also over on Aquarius Rising Africa when we have the live show so that we can figure this all out together. Um, and yeah. They can't, once you, once you see something, you can't unsee it, right? So Pandora's box has been opened. So anyway, you guys, I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful day, and I will talk to you soon.